sore. No one ever said housemaid or domestic. Pride matters more, and here's the truth of it. She was Tanty, a grandmothering substitute chained to Miss B, a former Hollywood come hither and Tanty's final misery. I couldn't name a single movie Miss B had starred in, but mother told us she was a first class bitch. Thirty years later, watching late night television, I recalled I met that bitch once. Ill preserved on celluloid, she fluttered there amidst her ersatz brood, but not in the same way I'd seen her flutter decrees upon my tanty. And my tanty, once a muckamuck in her own right, having flown an airplane solo in days when most women and Negroes were grounded, half fluttered in return to make sure her family had dimes and nickels. Tanty didn't tell us she was Miss B's maid, and I never knew a thing about it until I saw this black and white movie with Miss B, half a star among stars, given third place billing, nearly unrecognizable as the cold shrew I remembered flaunting dipped pearls, telling me to look and admire because I would never own anything quite like them. Tanty calmly laced Miss B's tea. With what? We never knew. So that Miss B napped a little longer on afternoons when Tanty fed us sugar cubes, spoke softly of days when she'd soared. Your poems uh, like this one um, about Tanti unveil these characters, they make them visible, and I think they have like, um, like a different layers of uh, excavation because these characters are invisible for many reasons. Uh, many of them are women, right. uh, black women, they are mm -hmm. uh, also immigrants in some cases. Right. Do you use specific tools or, or techniques to make these characters visible? Tanti was a real person. The photograph at the back of the book is of her standing next to the plane. She flew solo. Um, so I'm taking a lot of these stories. I, I consider myself essentially a storyteller Storyteller. who's chosen the genre of poetry. A lot of what I write when I'm writing these family stories are really for my nieces and nephews, my great nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. so that when my brothers and I are gone, they'll have these kernels of stories so they know where they came from. So that's, that's really what I'm striving for. You worked as a lawyer and uh, you practiced uh, for 15 years and then you became the director of uh, employee and labor relations at UCLA. You have done your homework. Yes, <laughs> and uh, while you were um, a lawyer and you were practicing, one day you decided to be a poet. That's pretty close to the truth. I, um, you know, I had dabbled in poetry in my younger years, but practicing law kind of put the kibosh on that. And I do remember literally sitting up in bed one day and saying, you know, the thing that's wrong with your life is you're not writing poetry. You're not reading poetry. You need to figure out an environment that's going to make that more possible. Uh -huh. And that's when I left the practice of law and went to work at UCLA. I started looking for every opportunity for workshops and um, seminars, readings, everything that I could go to to try to self-educate. Um, and David St. John was, was, I think, the first ongoing regularized workshop that I took, which, what a way to start, right? <laughs> you also say that um, uh, being a lawyer is a good uh, trainer, a good degree for a poet. I do remember early in my career filing a motion in court and arguing to the judge who denied my motion but said, Ms. Thompson, this is just so beautifully written. It's wrong. <laughs> but it's beautifully written. So yes, it's all about language and how you, um, how you use that language. And in law, of course, you're trying to convince that's not what you're trying to do as a poet. But still, it's about, it's about language and the beauty of language. When did you know that you had the ability for beauty in language? I'm still not sure that I know <laughs> that for a fact. It's certainly something that I always strive for. Um, I think part of that beauty comes from finding your own particular voice. And there's a poem in Beg No Pardon, 
how I learned where I come from. Mm -hmm. When I wrote that poem, I said, that's the voice. That, you know, that's the right music. That's, that's what's coming out of me naturally. So uh, it wasn't so much beauty, but a conviction that there was a particular voice that I needed to develop of my own. You have published uh, two chapbooks, uh, Through a Window and uh, We Arrive by Accumulation. Correct. And then two uh, full-length collection of, of poems. Uh, Beg No Pardon is your first book, published in 2007 right. by Perugia Press. And then in 2013, Start with a Small Guitar. The first book, um, Beg No Pardon, won not one but two awards, the Perugia Press First Book Award and also the Great Lakes College's New Writers Award. Right. Um, so it was a great uh, reception for a first book. How did you experience that reception? Uh, with a lot of shock. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, the idea of even having Beg No Pardon, as you said, I'd been working with David St. John and one day just to me out of the blue he said, well it's time for you to have a book. And I said, I don't have a book. He said, you have a bunch of poems. Look at them, put them together. Mm -hmm. I said, is that how it works? Isn't it more magical than uh -huh. that? Um, so he, with his encouragement, I did start to look at the poems and group them, came up with this manuscript. But you don't quite expect it to win. Um, so when I got the call from Perugia, it was, it was shocking. And then um, I think later the next year, the editor, Susan Can, who's the very understated, wonderful person, calls me at work, which she never did, and said, oh, how you doing? I said, I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> and she said, oh yeah, you know, you won the, the Great Lakes College. <sighs> so no more work got done that day, I can say it now that I'm no longer working there. <laughs> and it was quite shocking, but it's a wonderful prize because in addition to the money, which is always great, you get invited to read at colleges in the Midwest, Kenyon, um, Earlham, Hope College. I read at about six different colleges Wonderful. that are part of this consortium, which I never would have otherwise had the opportunity to do. Um, so that was, that was really terrific. So it, I, I still think it's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Uh, your family is from uh, St. Vincent uh, and, the, and the Grenadines, I yes. think they pronounce it, yes. in the Caribbean. Uh, St. Vincent has a very complicated uh, history. I think the name was given by the Spaniards. Yes. And then it was a French colony and then it was a British colony. Correct. Uh, Beg No Pardon uh, opens with this line, Where are my ancestors buried? Which other questions motivated this book? Um, I think that poem I referenced earlier, How I Learned Where I Come From, um, was really the motivating thread for this collection of poems because, as with many immigrants, my parents, they, they spoke about where they were from, but not in great detail. So I always felt like I had to, to pull it out of them and was fascinated with their how they experienced America when they arrived. And I, I'm still working on poems in that vein. Um, that was what was really compelling me to ask, how do we turn out to be this particular mm. family? And because my parents, my mother in particular, was very anxious to say she wasn't African American, she was Caribbean American, yeah. I really kind of fought against that when I was younger, but as I got older was really trying to understand why why that was important and how how that was different for them in this yeah. country. Tony Banston uh, says about uh, your book, Beg No Pardon, that the poems sing to your Caribbean ancestors. And I think the, the main power of the book is that you are able to, to bring these ancestors to life. For example, when you talk about your grandmothers. Right. And in one of them, uh, you say that the memory is composed, these are your words, are composed of myth and half-told stories. How much of uh, ancestry is storytelling? Oh, I think a lot of it is storytelling because you never have the whole story and then you have pieces of it passed through different people. So I have four older brothers and I'll say, well, mom said X. And one of the brothers will say, that's not how it happened. This is how it happened. So memory and, and half-told stories, I think, are how we arrive where we arrive. 
um, which is part of the reason I titled the, the chat book We Arrived by Accumulation, because it's an accumulation of all of these stories. What's hidden in here that's in, in explored in a manuscript that I'm, I'm seeking a publisher for now is that that grandmother poem is both about my Caribbean grandmother, but it's also about my birth mother because I was adopted. So I was trying to blend their stories in one poem. Mm. I didn't want to have that separation of families. I see. And it's, it's, it's kind of hidden in here. I don't talk about it in obvious ways, except for one poem she named Pamela, at, or she named P at birth. That's kind of about the adoption, but it's not as explicit. Let's uh, uh, listen to another, or another poem. Uh, it's called To Blackness, also from the same book from Beg No Pardon. To Blackness. As it happens, I have never tired of blackness. It's Marcus Garvey, Raisin in the Sun, Tuskegee Airmen. It's Strivers Row and Liver Lips. It's Dred Scott, Freed Man's Bureau Scott Joplin. Some say black is swarthy, gloomy, evil, fiendish, but we all spring from the tribes. Ashante, Bobo, Fulani, Wolof. Their cowrie shells and crobo beads sewn into our fading fabric. I don't know much about my native blackness. My daddy, he say Ibo, the only word he can give me. But it's the only word I need to get the old folks to remembering that an Ibo, Ututu, is morning, a Bali is night, and in any mirror, my Ihu, my face, is always black. I love that poem. Thank you. With all the languages there, it's fantastic. Thank you. There is one, uh, there is one poem called uh, uh, Raffia. Yes. And uh, it starts with a quote from Chris Abani. It says, to the, is it pronounced Ibu? Ibo. To the Ibo, um, everything is family, everything is connected. And then you take that line and you continue, uh, moon, fish, elephant tusks, the silkworm and its skin, no essential distinctions can be made. And I think it's a wonderful way to, uh, to break the stereotype of uh, the other, the excluded one. Correct. That is exactly what I was, I was going after. And um, Chris is, I believe, Ebo. So I, of course, was interested because that, that was the one thing when I asked my father, well, do you know where in Africa your family would have come mm. up? And he says, all he knew was that they were part of the Igbo. Which is in Nigeria? Uh, in the Nigerian yeah. area, yes, yeah. exactly. So um, I, I was happy to make that connection. And I was trying to assert in this poem that we have to stop making this, these distinctions between ourselves as human and even in the, in the world of nature. We're all connected in some way. And that's what I was, I was striving to get. So you hit it right on the <laughs> Um, your second book is a Start with a Small Guitar that was published by What Books. And uh, I think it's a more experimental book. Yes. You have more, uh, or you show more flexibility, you play with different forms. I think you dance a little more with uh, surrealism, maybe. Right. Um, you have this opening of a poem when you say, You speak to me of glitter, and I to you of a white goat. I, th I think it's just a great opening. Um, was the success of the first book um, paralyzing? Did you feel a lot of responsibility or it gives you confidence to, uh, to play with other types of poems? Um, on Monday, paralyzing. <laughs> on Tuesday, more confidence. Okay. Um, and you want to do, as a poet, I think something different. You, I think my more natural place are in the types of poems that are in Beg No Pardon, but I wanted to stretch myself um, and do some different types of things. Um, and so that's, that's really what I was going after and start with a small guitar. Something that you do very well um, in, I think in both books, is the way you treat uh, eroticism. Mm -hmm. Because it's always connected to, or not always, but it's many times it's connected to humor and uh, uh, sometimes in the same line, there is this um, uh, dialogue between eroticism and humor. There is one poem in uh, Start With a Small Guitar that is called The New Eroticism. Would you like to hear it? Yes. 
This is a fun poem to write, I have to say. <laughs> the New Eroticism. Because the 21st century has ditched that old school road to romance, you have found a new way to seduce me. Rather than stroke the honey spot where my neck succumbs to a shoulder that could wonder you, you stroke keys on some small black widget held in your palm until your want of me glows green on the screen, takes several minutes to reach me with its shagong tune, and then, with no one near me knowing why, causes my cheeks to redden. Gone the parchment papers with love sop writ in peacock blue. Gone the 2 a.m. whispers under cover of an inexhaustible dark, only a telephone wire between us. And because the time is now and we can never go back, and because I want you to inhale deeply, deeply, then whistle, I press fingers to my own widget's keys. Enter, enter, enter. The new eroticism. <laughs> well, and that was born from the fact that people don't write flowery letters on blue mm -hmm. parchment, and nobody does that anymore. This is the way that lovers communicate. They're texting each other. The books, uh, Beg Your Pardon, and Start With A Small Guitar, are different, but there are many elements in common, and I think one of these is uh, music. For example, we can find um, metronome, adagio, jazz, tango, wine chimes, uh, castanets, choirs, harmonies, drums, steel drums, guitars, Bob Marley, many other references. Um, so there's this attention to, uh, to music and also the attention to sound. And I think you talk in one of the interviews about the physicality of sound, like the pleasure of sound in the mouth. And I just always loved music. Uh, and I personally don't think a poem is done for me until I read it out loud, no matter mm -hmm. how great it may look on the page, the music of it, of it is important. And I love the instruments. I love how they're made. I love how they sound, um, how, how uh, different woodwinds can sound differently. I, I love all of that. <laughs> with, the, with the pleasure of, uh, of sound or with the pleasure of words, there is also the power of words. Yes. Um, there is one, um, there's one ending in one of the poems. Um, and it goes like this, so when I say it's over, I don't mean interlude or maybe. And the language is very precise, very, very specific. There's a sense of uh, um, like what has been selected by the poet is, is definite, like this is what it is. My dad, who was a closet poet, um, gave me a love of each individual word and how it sounded and what it meant and how it could be put together like a puzzle almost to, to say a, a million different things. So I am very precise or try to be very precise in picking very resonant words um, to convey meaning. I, I can spend, you know, it's the old Oscar Wilde quote a variation on it, you know, I worked so hard today, this morning I put a comma in, this afternoon <laughs> I took it out. Um, that's how I feel about the words. What about, nah, that's not right, I too see. many syllables, you know, whatever it is. I am very uh, definite in selecting particular words, which I think most poets are. I don't think I'm unique. In, um, in 2016, you won the, the COLA Award. Yes. I don't know if it's the 15 or 16. It, it, it covered 15, 16. 16. Yes. And uh, the COLA Award is the, the City of Los Angeles Individual Artist Fellowships. Um, and there is a publication that came uh, co collecting uh, um, information about all the winners Correct. in different categories. Um, can this person uh, write or, or wrote an essay about your work in this publication? And she talks about your admiration for two poets. One is Natasha Trethewey yes. and Marilyn Nelson. Yes. Um, I always say that when we admire a poet, uh, it, could ha it could be um, intimidating, like, well, this is so wonderful, I'm not going to write anything as good as I start writing, or it could be inviting. Right. 
So this, uh, why are these poets relevant to you and uh, were they intimidating or inviting? Well, they're both definitely intimidating. Uh, <laughs> Natasha was the former poet laureate of the U.S. I believe that Marilyn was the poet laureate of the state of Connecticut. Um, she is or was a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, both very accomplished women, but both very down to earth, very approachable. Um, I would say Natasha has been intimidating, but a great influence on me because what I admire, as well as her facility with language, is her ability to braid the personal with public and political history. And I, I tr aspire to do that um, in, in, greater w in greater and greater ways in my own work. Um, so that, that's her influence. Marilyn, I think, is one of the greatest storytellers in poetry on the planet. Um, what she's done with Emmett Till, um, Miss Crandall's, what is it, Miss Crandall's School for Colored Girls in Connecticut. She has excavated um, the history of people of color, African American people of, uh, in Connecticut, in ways I haven't really seen anybody do in mm. quite the same way. Although I would add Alberto Rios, um, who was the poet laureate of Arizona, I believe who does the same sort of thing with some of his family stories. So th those are the poets that, that really inspire me. One of uh, your poems ends with a very essential image of a writer. It says, so it comes to this, lean, a desk, a pencil. How is your relationship now with your work as a poet? It's, it's been fascinating to watch how the shaping of the poems have, has changed over time. I used to start at the computer writing broken lines. My current practice, which will probably change again, is to write in my journal line to uh, margin to margin, mm -hmm. and then in my head go back almost like a sculptor to try to find the way it wants to look on the page without a preconceived notion, unless I'm writing something that is a, that has a, has its own form, like a yeah. sonnet or whatever. But if it's a free verse, I want to sculpt it after I have the the language on the page, rather than saying it's going to be, you know, couplets. It's going to be, you know, a prose poem or what. I just want to write it out, margin to margin, and then go back and shape it like a sculptor would shape clay. It's interesting how we can kill something if the template is too strong. Right. I mean, exactly. it, of course, the form helps to, to right. gives you the, the scaffolding. But in many cases, if you have too much information about what you want to write. It's exactly. It's that it's the old saw. No surprise for the writer, no surprise right. for the reader. <laughs> so you want to say to yourself, oh, OK, I didn't know that when yeah, I started out. Exactly. Or I didn't have a plan when I started. Maybe I had a little kernel of an idea. But I, I didn't know, I want it to tell me a little bit what it wants to be. You know, I, I want to be a prose poem. Oh, <laughs> OK, that, we can do that. You were the, um, the editor of the publication Spillway uh, with uh, Susan Terrace, is yes, that right? Yes, yes. How long were you the editor and uh, how was that experience? Are you still involved with the Spillway? Yes. So Susan was the overall editor. Okay. I was the reviews and essays editor. So I was always looking for books to reviews and review and the occasional essay. I am still involved with it. We now have new editors. Susan mm -hmm. has stepped down. And Phil Taggart and Marcia De La O are now the editors, and their first issue will be coming out this summer, so I'm very much looking forward to that, but I'm still working with them on reviews and essays for that journal. What would you like to explore next? I've been working on a lot of centos, which are poems that take lines of other poets and reconfigures them. I've done some of these with individual poets, um, and then I've done them with a group of poets in one poem. And I'm doing a lot of wordplay uh, with poetry, and you'll see that in this last poem I'm going to read, um, in an effort to kind of get out of my way, because I've done all these family poems, and I've done poems about my adoption, and I, I kind of want to just play with language without any particular direction. Mm -hmm. It's like getting in the car and you start it down the road and say, oh, maybe I'll take a right here, because I've never been down this street. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm playing more with language, even though I've always done it in some ways in my poems. I'm trying to do it more intentionally now. So this poem that I'm going to read, which was published in Poetry, which I was over the moon about, is a poem called The Beauty Shell. And uh, this poem, every word in the body of the poem only uses the letters in the title, The Beauty Shell. So there are no R's, there are no O's, there are no yeah, ends. Mm -hmm. It's only these letters in the beauty shell. And the other thing that you need to know about it is as I was working on this, I stopped to watch Beyonce's video, Lemonade. <laughs> and when I came back to the poem, that's when it started to cook. So this is called The Beauty Shell. It has an epigraph, Think Beyonce's Lemonade. Bell as beast, eel as style, bats testy, best lastly, bluely astute, as bull, as beetle, as bay, as butte, beauty as lute, thus beauty as lush, late lethal, lust salty, she'll eye, she'll tally, yes stately, yet stealth, yes steely, yet sly, hey lathe, she taught, Hey, sleuth, she tail, he heel, he that, she bluesy, she ballsy, she bite, she shall. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.